Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk to you about the first time Fallout almost got canceled. Now what's interesting about this, I don't think I've ever talked about it publicly, but I don't even think most people on the team know about this. Most people know about the whole GURP situation and that almost, you know, got the whole project tangled up. Maybe I shouldn't say canceled, but certainly almost stalled, massively changed, whatever. I have mentioned that when Interplay got the D&D license, Fallout almost got, got canceled because they didn't see a need to divert, d devote resources to this grade B product when they had D&D that they called the license to print money. But there was one other time that it almost got canceled. And it was because of me. <laughs> so let me walk you through a story. So the spring of 95, Scott Everts was looking at open houses in the Orange County area. He decided he wanted to buy some place. And he knew I had been saving up. For the last four years, I had been saving super hard for a down payment, and I had one. I, I didn't go out to eat. Every day, like everybody did at Interplay, I didn't buy a new car. I was still driving this old hatchback that I used for college. Our parking lot at Interplay was often jokingly referred to as the new car lot. And, you know, I'm not talking about Fargo's Viper. I'm talking, there was a day I came in and there were three brand new Mitsubishi Eclipse parked all right next to each other in the lot, all different colors. And that's because... When a young person tended to get their first real job, they bought a new car. That was normal. But I was saving up. I was scrimping my my pennies. I wanted to buy a place. I'd always had a goal before I turned 30 that I'd buy a house. I know this is hard to realize then. It was hard to realize. It was hard to realize now, but it's, it was hard to realize then too. Um, I was 29. I was going to turn 30 at the end of the summer. So I went with Scotty to this open house and they had four models and he was looking at the, the one floor models. And we looked at the first two and I had a book on how to buy a house and I was pointing out things like, oh, this has really good flow. This is nice. This is nice. Scotty didn't really see what he wanted. But before we left, I'm like, let's look at the two story models. And the first one we looked at was model four. And I saw all these things that were bad. I'm like, oh my God, look at this. There's a lot of hallways in here. Uh, the stairs take up half the living room wall. I mean, that's going to be a hard wall to figure out how to use, blah, blah, blah. Then we looked at model three, the other two story, and I totally fell in love. It was, it wasn't a big house. It was like 1200 square feet, but the stairs went up to a little teeny like square of space that opened up into three bedrooms and a bathroom. The downstairs was one big living room, dining room, kitchen. So no hallway. It had an attached garage, but the coolest thing I liked was it had a wraparound yard. It wasn't a big yard. But it wrapped around to the front. Most of them had gates on the side. So you had a back and small side yard. This one, the gate was in front of the front door. Which meant, even back then, I was like, I want to get a dog. So I realized if I got this house, that if the front or back door opened and the dog got out, they would still be in the, in the yard. They wouldn't be able to escape. I really liked this house. I thought about it all night. Scotty and I went left there and went off to lunch. When I went home that night, I'm like, I just kept thinking about it. So the next day I drove there and I wanted to put my name on the list for that particular house I saw with that particular yard. But to do that, I had to give a down payment. Not, not the whole down payment, sort of like a, a deposit. And if I decided later I didn't want it, I'd lose the deposit. But if any other reason came up, like something I will talk about soon, I'd get the deposit back. So they said, great. They took some information from me. They said, we're passing on to our, uh, the guy who handles mortgages and he'll get back to you. So I went back to Interplay. I think it was two or three days later, I heard from the guy. And he said, I'm going to refund your deposit. You don't qualify for a mortgage. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you are not paid nearly enough to qualify for a mortgage on this house, even if you put down 20%. And I was like, but 
of course I qualified. I saved up for this mortgage, the down payment on the salary. I'm, I I can easily pay what the monthly would be. And he goes, nope, in the eyes of the bank and our financial officers, you would not qualify. So I asked him, what would it take to qualify? And he told me the minimum number. And then he said this, he goes, I'm surprised how little you're paid. This is, you're in an industry, you're 29. This isn't your first job in that industry. You have several products behind you. And you not only have a bachelor's in computer science, you have a master's. I see a lot of applications cross my desk and you are vastly underpaid relative to your peers, people in your age group and professional background. And I said, well, what are they paid? And he gave me a number way higher <laughs> than what I needed to qualify for this mortgage. And this started to bug me because I was like, oh. now this would be, like I said, late spring, possibly early summer of 95, but I think it was late spring. So we were not only not fallout. We were full on GURPS, wasn't a big team. Uh, then it was, I think it was under 10 people. And this kind of bothered me. So I decided to go talk to Alan Pavlish and say, hey, I want to raise. Even though we were halfway through the year, it was a, not a raise time. So I told him, hey, I want to raise. I think I'm underpaid. And this is why I want it. And he's like, I'm not going to give you a raise just because you want to buy a house. And I said, okay, but I really do want this house. So I'm going to start looking around. And I said, I already know. Before I came here, I turned down a job at McDonnell Douglas. I'm going to call them up today and ask them about it. I just want you to know, because I don't want you to be surprised if I come in in the next few days and give you a two-week notice. And he said, you would seriously do that? You'd abandon your project? And I was like, I just found out I'm massively underpaid. What, what's the story we're going to talk about here? And I will give him credit. And I don't know who he talked to, although I suspect he may have talked to a producer Michael Quarles, who was on Stonekeep, who I really looked up to. And that guy always had my back. I suspect he said something. I really do. But the next day, um, Alan Pavlish said, what do you need to qualify? And I told him what the minimum was. Probably should have upped it, but that's just, I just, oh, well, the mortgage guy said this. And he upped me to that. He said, we're, we're do it. You know, don't go around bragging about this. We can't do it. And this is a one-time special thing and you should feel special. And, you know, now you're super well paid. Footnote. As I became a producer and started giving people raises, I quickly found out that my pay as a, a programmer there was still pretty middling. They were much better paid programmers who had less experience and less uh, education than I did. And all the 3D programmers were paid better. Than, uh, not 3D artists were paid better than me. 3D artists were paid a lot. And this was a new thing in the mid-90s, mid to late-90s. They were all paid better than I was. I know this. I did their reviews and I gave their bonus at the end. But I was like, you know what? I'm super happy. I called the mortgage guy. And he said, great. Um, that happened fast. I hadn't taken my name off. I hadn't asked for the deposit back. So technically, I'm still in line for that one. I got the loan. I got the house. Um, technically, I bought it before I turned 30, but I didn't get the key until after I turned 30. So whether or not I made my goal is debatable. The interesting thing is one of my neighbors had this huge, when I, after I moved in, had this huge um, Doberman named Jake that decided I was his best friend in the whole world. And Jake would burst through their screen door and run at me, turn around and sit on my foot and make me pet him. The first time that happened was a little scary. I'm like, I love dogs, but there is a 120 pound Doberman bearing down on me. They always apologized. They would lock that screen door. Jake broke it once to get out when he saw me at the mailbox. But I got to meet that family and they told me how they really wanted my house because they liked the yard better. Mine was one of three that had that wraparound yard and in, in the entire complex of a hundred. And that they were hoping that I would refund my deposit uh, they had come one day after me and asked to be put on that list. Um, and I always felt a little bad about that because they had kids and everything. And I'm like, but I want to get a dog too. Jake would have loved that yard. 
So some of you may be going, well, wait, if you would quit, wouldn't Fallout have gone on? I'm like, well, maybe, but I don't know who would have taken my spot. I had a lot of code invested in it. And you got to remember, there were two more points coming up in the near future where when we got the D&D license and I begged it not to be canceled. And then again, when we lost the GURPS license and I said, look, I can replace my libraries pretty quickly. I'm not sure if we if if we would have gotten through both of those choke points without my begging and pleading and crunching. Maybe, but I always look back at that as like, hmm, I think I put the project in jeopardy. But this is something I want to get back to when I talk about nuance. Because I know there are two radical interpretations to this video. And I hope people don't make them. I'm telling you right now, there are two groups out there that won't want to spin this. There's the first group to go, wow, Tim is really a jerk. He was willing to put the entire project at Jeopardy because he wanted to buy a house. What an entitled maniac, egomaniac. I think that's a radical interpretation of the story I just told. Another way, though, is going, oh, my goodness, Interplay massively and knowingly underpaid him. What horrible, evil people. You know, they offered me a job at an amount, and I took it. I'm a big boy. I had my big boy pants on. Now, later, when I found out I was being underpaid, I made a big boy decision. I'll go somewhere that pays me better. That's kind of the interpretation of Tim is a victim, you know, interplay bad guy, that I'm trying to get people to avoid. There is a middle road here, which is I accepted a job for the pay. Later on, I realized it didn't let me achieve some life goals that I wanted. And I wanted to get one of those life goals achieved. And I, I tried. And guess what? Everything worked out. The moral of this story that I think you should walk away with is the development of Fallout occurred on a knife edge. Multiple times during its development, it could have fallen either way and never been made. Sometimes those were decisions that the company was making. Sometimes it was decisions that individuals on the team were making. I will tell you, though, individual t uh, stories that, in that involved me, that I was personally involved with. But I will tell you, there were other individuals on the team that made, store that made decisions on a personal basis that did affect the development of Fallout and endangered it. But those stories are those people's stories to tell. So I don't want you walking away thinking... I was a hero or a villain or a victim or that Interplay was or that anybody on the team was, but just that game development is hard and it is fraught with peril. And that peril comes from all directions. Looking back, I always go, wow, it's super lucky Fallout even ever got made. But I could tell you the similar stories about Arcanum, Temple, Vampire, Wildstar, South Park, Pillars, Tyranny, Outer Worlds, every game I ever worked on, in hindsight, you could tell that it passed over a very dangerous period where bad things could have happened and were successfully navigated around. That's what I'm hoping these stories help people who are in game development get some perspective on their own games and people who aren't in game development get some understanding of how games are made. So I hope you enjoy that fun story about how I endangered Fallout.